Hi, I'm Frank Lavallo, host of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, we'd like to thank Visible Voice Books for sponsoring the Novel Conversations giveaway, which gives listeners a chance to win all eight classic novels featured in our fifth season. You can enter through our Novel Conversations Facebook page or tweet us at novel underscript converse, that's C-O-N-V-E-R-S, or head to our website blog, thefrontporchpeople.com backslash blog. Visible Voice Books is our local go-to for delving into our favorite books in a relaxed, inviting environment. And if you're not here in Cleveland, Ohio, you can always support Visible Voice Books by shopping online at visiblevoicebooks.com. Visible Voice Books. Without literature, life is hell. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. For each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Today's conversation is about the novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And I'm joined in my conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey. Katie, Peter, hello. Hi, Frank. Hey, thanks for having us. All right, guys, before we get started, let me read a quick summary of our story. And I know this summary is going to be very different from what our listeners out there are familiar with when it comes to the novel Frankenstein. On an expedition to the North Pole, English explorer Robert Walton and his crew find the weak and weary Victor Frankenstein stranded among the ice floes. They rescue the stranger who, in time, tells Walton the story of how he came to be traveling alone in the Arctic. Walton relays the tale in letters to his sister Margaret Seville in England. The tale that Victor Frankenstein tells Robert Walton, and that Robert Walton communicates to his sister, make up the bulk of our story, Frankenstein. All right, let's start with you, Peter, your initial thoughts of the novel. Frank, I have to start out with even the title of the book. Now, I thought Frankenstein was the name of the monster, but of course it isn't. It's the name of the scientist who created Frankenstein. Right, Dr. Victor Frankenstein. There was no Igor. (laughs) Come on. I didn't even get a sense of the appearance of the creature. There wasn't much of a description of any of the characters, and perhaps the most interesting fact about our monster... He's a vegetarian. (laughs) Right, yes. We do find out a lot about the monster when the monster tells us his story. But I could not physically describe him to you. I couldn't picture it in my mind, what he looks like. Well, I think the author was allowing everyone to come up with their own version of a monster. She gave you enough of his enormous proportions and the speed and the eyes, and I think she just allowed every reader to conjure up your own vision of a monster. And Peter, I also think we're a bit of a victim of the movies. As soon as you say the word Frankenstein, we all conjure up a very similar image in our minds. But that's not what Mary Shelley had in mind. Right. And also, what I find interesting is we not only get the creature story of this novel, we get the Victor Frankenstein story in the novel. We get the Walton story in this novel. Do we really get a story, though? It's, It's all about letters. We have to trust that the dialogue in the letter is what the person actually spoke. Katie, did you have a problem with that form, the the form of the novel? No, not at all. I think it's just the literary technique that Mary employed, the epistolary technique. It was very common in the times, and you have so many different ways to get your story across. Uh, Because of that, I, I didn't trust it. This novel really is a collection of stories, a collection of letters. That's what epistolary means. It's a collection of letters, a story told in letter form. Uh, And I understand why maybe at this moment you don't trust these letters. No, I don't. Well, Peter, it is fiction. Yes, it is fiction. But now we're talking about the probability and the believability of that fiction. Okay, I'd like to start the discussion here about this novel, how the story develops, how we get these various little stories that make up the collection of the novel Frankenstein. Katie, how does Mary Shelley start her novel Frankenstein? With one character, Robert Walton, the adventurer, writing a letter to his sister, Margaret, who's in England. Well, Peter, I guess that begs the question, is this an adventure trip or is he on the quest of something? No, no, he came into some money and he wanted to do something that would bring him fame and fortune, try to go where no one else had ever been before. So really, for the first 30 pages or so of our novel Frankenstein, we're dealing with a Robert Walton. 
a character we've never heard of before. He's never been in any movie I've seen. No, nope, absolutely not. And we don't come into Victor until they pick up this man on an ice floe, half dead, and here it is, Victor Frankenstein. They bring him back to health, and eventually Walton becomes friends with Frankenstein and, and tells him of his plans to sail to the North Pole. And then Victor tells him why he wants to go with them. And Katie, this is where we now get Victor's story. But even before we get Victor's story, we have other little stories that Robert Walton tells. Walton talks about his own loneliness and that he really needs a friend. He becomes friends with the captain, and he's very enamored with the captain because the captain tells this story that he had a tremendous love. But the woman was not in love with him. She was in love with a poor boy, and the woman's father would not allow her to marry him because he was poor. So... The captain, in an act of true generosity of love, thought it was more important that his darling have true love with the poor boy. So he gives them money so that the poor man would be acceptable in the father's eyes. So we were not getting anywhere near a monster for pages and pages and pages. Right. Let's remind our listeners, this story is being told to us in letters, and we get all this information about Robert Walton in the letters that he's writing his sister. But let's talk about Victor's story. All right. Victor was born and raised in an affluent, comfortable family town outside of Geneva. He had a very caring and doting parents, and he was a bright young man. But before he left for college, his ambitions were really first fired by reading about alchemy and the occult. Yes. And that's where his interest in science first went. Well, he describes himself from early childhood on as having all of these great interests. But he's also an only child for quite a few years. So he's living in an adult world. He has more of the interests of an adult than he does of a typical kid. But Peter, he does eventually get two more brothers. Ernest and William. One of our other major characters comes to live in this family of the Frankensteins as well. And that's Elizabeth Lanza. Elizabeth was the niece, and she was of a similar age to Victor. And Alfonso, Victor's father, brought the child to Switzerland and raised her as one of the family. And the parents would always talk about how this is the woman who is destined to be Victor's partner in life. But not for a while. Uh, Let's get back to Victor. He does go to college, and he does come to realize that all this reading he's been doing, all this that he's learned about the occult and alchemy, he's really been studying the wrong sciences. Right. Victor talks about two professors in particular. One is extremely abrupt with him. The other professor is much kinder and gentler in his treatment of Victor, and he introduces him to the modern scientists. And the modern sciences, right? The natural sciences, geology, botany, chemistry. And Victor, of course, does become very proficient in these subjects. It is marvelous the way all the characters, including the monster, can acquire vast amounts of information and store it and be able to put it in practical use in periods of just a couple of months. And the practical use that Victor Frankenstein puts his knowledge to? Of course, creating the monster. The monster. You know, we get pages and pages of buildup of the preparation that he makes to bring his monster to life, but then the monster comes to life in, I don't know, two sentences. Yeah, but that was not his intention to create a monster. He wanted to create life. He did. So we can honor him and be loyal to him. And then the author doesn't even attempt to give an explanation of how the monster was created. At least in Hollywood, we had some electricity. There was reference to it. When Victor was in his teens, he witnessed a tree exploding from being struck with a lightning bolt. At that point, Victor then has passages and passages about the power of electricity as a force in creating life. But the author doesn't give us any justification of that. I think it just alludes to the fact that this is going to be the means of the monster coming to life. Well, what happens when the monster comes to life? The immediate reaction of Victor... He goes to bed. He goes to bed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Victor does quite a bit of fainting in this book. Now, this is something that he spent a couple of weeks putting all these parts together. Years, Peter. Well, yeah, and all of a sudden, it's alive! And he decided, well, this is ugly. He just turned around and he goes to bed? Well, he doesn't just go to bed. He becomes violently ill. He does know that he's made a mistake. He comes to realize that rather quickly. Right, yeah. And what happens to the monster during all these months when we have Victor Frankenstein sick in bed, being taken care of by his loyal friend Henry Claval? The monster is devastated that his creator would desert him. He could tell by his face that he was horrified and runs from him. 
All right, let me stop you there because I want to leave our creature on the run for a few more moments. Victor Frankenstein is now telling Robert Walton that after he creates his monster, he's sick in bed for six or seven months and then heads back to Geneva and finds out that there was a disaster in his family. Well, he actually is informed of it before he leaves for Geneva in a letter from his father. His father is saying that the youngest brother, William, age six or seven, has been found murdered. And the father alludes to the fact that Justine briefly described as a much-loved nanny, has been accused of the murder. So Victor, accompanied by Henry, returns home to Geneva. And then when he goes down to the spot where William was found murdered, he looks up and he sees the apparition of the monster. And Victor comes to the realization the monster had killed his own brother. And Peter, Justine was being tried for this murder because they found a locket of William's in her pocket. That's why she's been accused of this murder. Yes, yes. And everyone came forward, including Victor, to testify that Justine is the greatest girl in the world and the greatest servant, and she would never do this. And none of the townspeople believe that Justine could have done this murder. But Victor, he knows she didn't do this murder. Well, he could have, at this time, bring up the fact that he believes that his monster has done this. Well, does he tell the authorities? No. Now that's something Victor does very well. He keeps the monster's existence to himself. For his own protection. For whose protection? Well, Victor's. But initially, Victor says, of course justice will prevail, and the truth will come out, and she will be proven innocent. And she is, in fact, executed. Yes. She's hanged. And of course, Victor goes on at great length. He can't tell anyone, but he says, I am as guilty for their deaths as the monster. He can tell someone, but that's the sin right there. He did not, and he would not, tell anyone. Eventually, the time comes where Victor does confront his monster. Up in the hills of the Alps, in a cave. And the monster confronts him. And when the monster and Victor confront each other, we get two things happening. We get the monster's story, and he makes a very demanding request of Victor Frankenstein. Peter, tell me about the request first, and then we can get back to the monster's story. Sure. Now, the monster says, I've been rejected by everybody. I'm shunned. I receive no warmth or love. So I want you to create another creature for me in the form of a woman. And we'll go off to the jungles of South America, and you'll never see us again. If you will not do this, I will turn back to my murderous ways, and it will all come back to you. The only ones who will die will be the ones that will bring you sorrow. Now, Victor, of course, is shocked by this request. He refuses to make a second creature. He already knows the havoc that's been wrecked by his first creature. But the creature starts to tell him a story about how he came to know about companionship, how he came to know the language. And once we hear the creature's story, it did give Victor pause to consider the request at least. But let's take a quick break, and when we pick back up, I'd like to dive right into the story of the creature. But first, we've had the wonderful opportunity to have our show sponsored by a great company called The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a streaming service brought to you by The Great Courses, the leading global media brand for lifelong learning and personal enrichment. You'll get to choose from thousands of in-depth videos by the world's greatest professors, from Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, and experts from National Geographic and the Smithsonian Museums. This is college-level learning, but without student loans, the pressure of homework, or grades. And the Great Courses Plus app makes it possible to watch or listen to lectures at any time. As fans of Novel Conversations, we're giving our listeners a special limited-time offer. Right now, The Great Courses Plus is giving away a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. We highly recommend the course Life Lessons from the Great Books. Professor Rufus Fears draws us into the world of masterpieces like Macbeth, Brave New World, Odyssey, and more, exploring the wisdom that can be gleaned from each story and the many ways it can be applied to any culture or stage of life. This is something we always do with our discussions on Novel Conversations. So if you enjoy taking in the wisdom of some of the greatest authors that ever lived, please look into taking the course Life Lessons from the Great Books on the Great Courses Plus app. Katie, quickly, are there any life lessons you might want to tell us about that you learned or got from a great book? Well, that's a pretty broad question. (laughs) It is, it is. The great books span from Aristotle to Dickens, you know, there's so many different things to learn from them. But I think overall, you've got a great sense of humanity in general. You you learn about civilization and, and the history as you go. 
couldn't agree with you more. Peter, how about yourself? Well, not a specific title, but uh, a body of work that, like a great book, makes me stop and think. Uh, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk and peace activist and Zen master. Uh, things he said like, there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. And we have to walk in a way that we only print peace and serenity on the earth. Walk as if you are kissing the earth with your feet. Things like that that make me stop and think. You know, guys, this sounds like something you both would enjoy. And right now you can both take advantage of a free offer that the Great Courses Plus app is offering to all our listeners. You can get an entire month for free. And to start your free month trial, all you have to do is sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash novel. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash novel. All right, back to our discussion on the novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. This is the part where we get to hear more from the monster. He's been brought to life. He's been animated. He's now speaking our language. So now let's get into the creature story. Katie, do you want to start with that? The monster has told Victor to come into my cave and I will tell you my story. (laughs) Now, of course, when the monster comes to life, he's able to walk and run, but he doesn't have communication. He doesn't understand a language. Actually, there's a couple of great scenes where he talks about that. He doesn't even understand his own senses at the moment. He has to learn about taste. He has to make sense of the sounds that he's hearing. Right, and then he goes off into the woods. But he travels by night. Right, that's correct. He comes upon other people, and he knows enough emotion to be so devastated by the rejection of all these people who shrink from him. They run from him, throw sticks at him, throw stones at him. He finds his way, he sees a light, and it's in a cottage. And through a crack in the wall, he's able to observe, and he sees a very old man who's blind, a young man and a young girl. He hasn't learned language yet, but he is developing empathy, and he's actually an extremely intelligent monster. He observes that there's a goodness in the younger couple, because they have very little food, yet they immediately make sure that the old blind man has a greater portion of food. And the young man will begin reading at night, and this is their recreation. This is how the monster begins to understand words. Needless to say, within the next three or four months, the monster had to learn to read Paradise Lost, Dante's Inferno, Hovel's History of the World, and he could speak a few languages too. It's a little bit crazy, especially when you can smell him from a mile away. (laughs) Now, Peter, it doesn't quite happen that fast. Uh, I do agree with you 100%. It's a little preposterous. That's not really the point of this story, right? The point of the story is to tell us, as you said, Katie, he's very bright and this monster can learn. And he has a generous spirit. He wants to help these people, so he collects the wood at night and leaves it for them to find. He sees that these people have happiness, and he wants to have happiness. And in order to get that happiness, he comes up with a plan on how he's going to introduce himself to this family. But the monster's plan of attack is to wait for the young people to leave. He'll talk to the old man. The old man is blind, so he'll be able to hear his heart speak. And Peter, how does that work out for the creature? Oh, it worked out just fine. You know, the old fellow just laughs, and then they get along just great. But the monster makes a mistake. Instead of having the old man introduce him to the family, he attempts to just introduce himself in the hopes that the old man starts doing some talking on his behalf. And how successful is that? Well, the son took one look at him, and the woman screamed and fainted. The son starts throwing rocks and clubs at him and ran him off. And so this is really what leads the creature to make his request of Victor Frankenstein. He wants a companion, and he promises that if given a companion, he'll go into the most remote areas of the world and neither of them will ever be heard from again. Don't fulfill my request, and I will make your life a living hell. He pretty much tells Victor, look, I gave it a chance. It's not going to work. I've given up on trying to be accepted by you and all the other humans. Give me someone just like me so that I'm not condemned to such a lonely life. And again, he says, I'm really a good guy, Victor. You didn't create a monster, but the circumstances have made me a monster. I I don't agree. This creature was murderous. He had no problems at all killing an innocent youth and then covering up what he did. He's not a good guy. But Peter, he does tell Victor that the death of Victor's brother was an accident. Yes, he does. He presents it as an accident. When he saw William, he thought, well, this is a human that is young and childlike. 
they haven't learned to hate yet. Of course, the seven-year-old William screams and shrieks and threatens the monster and mentions his name. Mr. Frankenstein will get you, he screams at the monster. And when he hears the name Frankenstein, my God, this is the family of the monster. The monster is referring to Victor now as the monster. And Peter, remember, we're attributing Justine's death to Victor. We haven't attributed that to the creature. No, it's all very self-serving to say, well, they provoked me. They yelled your name and everything. Hey, nerds, I'm Sarah, the paper nerd. And if you've ever wondered what goes into that greeting card you just sent or received, well, quite a lot. Get your paper fix on the paper fold where I host an enchanting mix of personalities and players all nerding out on my favorite topic, stationery. From the designs of our snail mail communications to the precious space created when two people correspond, there's a lot to cover. So come grab a seat in the stationery community's only five-star paper salon, The Paper Fold, now part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. He had no problem setting up Justine. He's the one that put the locket in her pocket. This was plotted, and this is what he wanted. Notwithstanding all that, Victor does agree to create a bride for Frankenstein. Oh, I hate to use that term. That, that just does become the movie. It sure does. But he does agree to create a companion. Let's use the word companion. He decides to go off with his friend Henry, and they go off through England and Scotland, and Victor ends up on an island, and he decides here's where he's going to start to create a second creature. Now, only five people lived on this island. Five little houses or huts. And he rented one. <laughs> and he got all the parts. <laughs> oh, man. We have to give Mary Shelley some license, right? He buys furniture on an island that only has three or four shacks on it. He brings in all these chemicals, presumably finds the body parts to create a woman, has all his tools with him, and actually starts to create a second creature. And none of the five people on the island? Come on, it doesn't bother them at all? But it does bother Victor Frankenstein, and eventually he decides he's not going to do this. Because he couldn't trust it. He didn't trust the monster at all. It was the woman that he was going to create that he couldn't trust. He actually trusted his own male monster, but he thought, if I make this woman, she didn't make a pact with me. The other monster did. What if she's filled with only evilness? Uh, This is where I feel Victor finally gets some religion. And he decides, you know, I'm not going to be part of this. I'm not making any deals with this monster who is very, very devious. And I don't know if I did complete this, would he and the other monster keep their bargain? So he said, no, I'm not going to do this. And he destroys the work that he's already put together. He rode out and he dumped it in the lake. And the creature sees this and he confronts Victor and tells him, well, that's it. All promises are off. And he has a very strong line. He says to Victor, I will be with you on your wedding night. And then he takes off. As you said, Peter, Victor dumps the remains of the second creature, and because of a storm, he's kept from landing through the night. Eventually, the next morning, he lands in another village in Ireland, only to be confronted with angry townspeople. Victor says, where am I? And they say something like, you are in the midst of a group of very angry Irishmen. (laughs) Briefly, they take him to the magistrate because there has been a murdered body washed up on shore. And Victor doesn't know who's been murdered, but he sure knows who the murderer is. Well, here the reader will see it coming, but... You know, I'm not sure. I didn't see it coming. I've got to be honest. I I knew eventually it would happen, but I didn't see it coming here in Ireland. So tell us, what didn't I see coming? Okay, here it is. His dear old friend Henry, who has been murdered. Strangled. And Victor, of course, faints again and immediately has a brain fever. And he's thrown in prison, but they try to make the best of it for three or four months. Right. The townspeople want to rehabilitate him to try to make him better because they don't want to hang a sick man. They want him to be well when they hang him. And here's something throughout, like this whole book. Someone comes to Victor's rescue. And in this case, it's the father. (sighs) You know, everybody throughout the whole book, Victor gives nothing. He wouldn't give anybody the sleeves out of his vest, but everybody's doing for Victor. They have a lot of streets named after Victor. One way. (laughs) Okay. The father does come and does bail him out and takes him home. Yeah, he takes him home, says, you've had some desperate things happen in your life, some real disappointments. You know, well, your mother died, your brother was murdered, uh, the family maid, she was hung, you know, best friend now was murdered, and and he was going to be tried for the murder. Yeah, yeah, it's been a good day. 
Well, Peter, we might finally actually have a good day. Victor comes home, and it's determined that the thing that will give Victor happiness is his marriage to Elizabeth. I think, Peter, this is where I will disagree with you. Victor believes that his marriage to Elizabeth, although destined to be short, will make Elizabeth and the family happy. He knows he really shouldn't go into this marriage. He knows that on his wedding night, the creature will kill him. He knows that it will happen, but he decides the only way to get the family out of the doldrums it's in is to have this marriage, to have this ceremony, to give them a good day. And then, yes, I will be killed, or I'm going to try my darndest to make sure it doesn't happen, but at least we'll have a few good moments. Everything in the entire book is telegraphed. You always know what's coming. So now we know how the monster works. He does not harm Victor. He has no intention of harming Victor. He harms everything that Victor loves and everybody who's ever done things for Victor, and they pay the price. Not Victor. And sure enough, on the wedding night, go ahead, tell me what happens, Peter. Well, now, this is just the thing. With all this history, he sends Elizabeth up to the bedroom. I'll be up later, and don't you worry about a thing, because I'm going to take care of the monster. Yeah, well, he arms himself, and he sits down there, and nothing happens until... Surprise! There's a scream from the bedroom. And by the time he gets up there, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised. The monster got Elizabeth. All right, now that one I did see coming. Uh, Well, uh, yeah, and this is a pretty bright guy. Why didn't he see it coming? He's never been confronted, never physically harmed by the monster. I agree. I don't know why he didn't see it coming. This was Mary Shelley's decision, and there we are with it. But now what happens after that, Katie? He then decides he's going to devote his life now to chase down the monster and kill him. He's going to destroy the monster. And off he goes. He travels all over. He did go through all sorts of hardships, and then, along the way, when he's starving and on his last leg, he finds some food lying there. Left for him by... The, the monster. monster. The, the monster. Yeah. You know, and then, then the monster says, I may have a little fun with this, too. And it gets to the point where they're going to the North Pole, and then we end up half dead on a dog sled on an ice floe. And this is the moment where Robert Walton meets Dr. Frankenstein. Exactly. And we get this story. And then, come on, you know what happens. Go ahead, tell me. Yeah. Victor has the unmitigated gall to die. He got sick again. Yeah, and he dies. And then the monster, he comes right back to that ship and goes in there and says, oh, dang, I I wanted to tell him that I loved him. (laughs) I'm just too late, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. Well, wait, wait, wait. Who's he talking to now? Robert Walton. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And Walton was standing there with his jaw on the floor when he sees this monster. You know, he just lost his friend. Right, a friend who had just told him a story he didn't quite believe, and then now, here it is, standing right in front of him. Yeah, and now it, it really gets exciting, because the monster says, Well, I'm done now, so I'm going to go up to the North Pole, and I'm going to set myself on fire and burn myself up and let the winds take my ashes <laughs> and blow it all over. Well, I want to know, how's he going to start a fire up there in the North Pole? Not too many trees in the neighborhood. This was a ghost story. It lacks total... I think the word is verisimilitude. Oh, you mean truth? Of course it does. It's just preposterous. It's a ghost story. The author might not have to prove things as facts here, right? Now, Katie, that's a good point. Is this just a ghost story? Should we read it, relax, take it easy? Are we demanding too much from this story, Peter? It was a conceit. That's the way I read it. This was a young girl who hung around with some literary heavyweights, and she wanted to show them how smart she was. In a ghost story, there's some sense of dread, a sense of suspicion, some, you know, mystery. There was none of that in this book. Katie, are you on board with Peter? Well, I think she did show them how smart she was, but the book was written 200 years ago. 200 years ago. The readers would have been frightened by some of the passages. The importance of the book is that it was the first of the Gothic novels, I don't think you can compare it today with Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th (laughs) version 17? (laughs) Something like that. (laughs) Guys, you know, I think Mary Shelley was striving for something a little bit more here. I don't think it was just a cartoonish ghost story. I mean, the subtitle is A Modern Prometheus. She definitely wanted us to hearken back to some of the Greek antecedents to think about how this might relate to a mythology. 
my question is, what did she say about women in this book? There's not a single strong woman in this book. Yeah, even to the point of their birthright, none of these women have parents. They were all foundlings. They were orphaned. Uh, And this is the daughter of one of the earliest pro-feminists of the time, Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote a vindication of the rights of women. Yeah, and her father. They were very visionary people. And I will tell you that I had a few chuckles while reading certain parts of this book when the author would describe a couple of the men. As the adventurous, pioneering men, I'm telling you, these men, they fainted. They did. They took to the bed for months. They suffered brain fevers, and they were physically rather frail, and they were rather frail emotionally, too. They fainted even more than a woman in a Southern romance novel. (laughs) Well, that's true. (laughs) That's a good line. Are there any lines or quotes or moments from the novel that you want to share with us, Peter? Well, there is. You know, the very end of the book, when the monster's going to do himself in. Please read that for us. All right. It says, Farewell, I leave you, and in you the last of humankind whom these eyes will ever behold. Farewell, Frankenstein. If thou wert yet alive and yet cherished a desire of revenge against me, it would be better satiated in my life than in my destruction. But it was not so. Thou didst seek my extinction, that I might not cause greater wretchedness. And if yet in some mode unknown to me thou hadst not ceased to think and feel, thou wouldst not desire against me a vengeance greater than that which I feel. Blasted as thou wert, my agony was still superior to thine, for the bitter sting of remorse will not cease to rankle in my wounds until death shall close them forever. I know, Peter, you feel that the monster has absolutely no soul to him, but from this passage, I think he does. And also, when he was pleading with Frankenstein to give him a partner, not to desert him, the quote that I liked was when he said, O Frankenstein, remember that I am thy creature. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel, whom thou drivest from joy for no misdeed. Everywhere I see bliss, from which I alone am irrevocably excluded. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy, and I shall be virtuous. He was like the real Adam and Eve. He knew about love. I'm glad you read that passage, Katie, because for me, it's the reverse of the Adam and Eve story, actually. Adam and Eve sinned and were forced out of the Garden of Eden. This creature, all he wanted was a companion so that he could leave the hell he was in. He would go to the wilds of South America, go to their Garden of Eden. He wanted to get into that Garden of Eden. Frank, you're right. When the monster pleaded with Dr. Frankenstein again and again, he said, Look, I've never harmed animals. I'm not concerned about eating animals. I eat berries. I eat nuts. Let us find our own paradise. No one will be harmed. No living creature is harmed. We have no interest in them. You know, it's those kind of moments that elevated this story for me, made it a little bit more than just a monster story or just a ghost story. Clearly, it was written 200 years ago, as you said, and there's holes in the story. There's holes in the narrative. There are some preposterous occurrences. I can't read Milton, and here we have a seven-month-old creature reading Milton. I'm going to agree with you there, Peter, but I do believe there's more to this novel than just a couple scary moments. Don't forget, what scared people 200 years ago is different from what scares us now. We've become desensitized to some of this horror with writers like Stephen King. I mean, actually, is our monster in Frankenstein any more preposterous than a monster car threatening people or a monstrous 30-foot shark threatening an island town in Peter Benchley's Jaws? All right, let's do a little comparison between this and, say, Dracula, which was written in the late 1800s, a few decades after Frankenstein. There was a recognized evil in Dracula. What was there to fear in Frankenstein? What was there to even concern yourself with? Again, I think this novel is more than just about a scary monster. Mary Shelley has something to say to us about the act of creation. What does a creator owe his creation? What does a creation owe to his creator? You don't have to be scared by Frankenstein to find this book worth reading. I believe this is a book worth reading. But you know what? I'm going to ask our listeners out there to read this book for yourselves. Pick it up, read it, and maybe have a novel conversation about this with someone and find out for yourself if this is more than just a ghost story or a monster story. And with that, we'll end our conversation here. I'd like to thank our guest readers, Katie Smith and Peter Toomey, for joining me today to talk about the novel Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. 
Thanks so much for having us. Yep, thank you, Frank. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. For more information about upcoming Novel Conversations, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to our website at thefrontporchpeople.com. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. A special thanks to producer Julie Fink, audio engineers Sean Ruhlhoffman, Eric Coltnow, and Dave Douglas, and executive producer Joan Andrews. We'd also like to thank our researchers, Kathy Browning and Kevin Coggle. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.